Um, and um, I'll give you, I'll give you the stage. Well, okay. I guess I better wake up pretty fast. Then. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, thank you all for coming to listen to a Jumer fall. Just talk about agriculture. It's kind of an unusual connection in some ways, but it's a very logical and simple one. Uh, and what I want to do is basically introduce you all to the thought processes I've gone through over the last 15 years or so, spending nights and weekends and a fair part of my research effort looking into uh, how the way people treat land, and in particular agricultural lands, affects not only erosion, but things like soil organic matter, the productivity of farms, and where I've ended up most recently um, in a collaboration with my wife, who's a biologist, uh, is looking at the connections with human health. So let me share my screen here, and I'll get rolling on um, trying to tell you that story. Um, but it's a story that um, goes back uh, essentially four books now uh, to when I was working on Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations back in the, the early 2000s, which was really a natural outgrowth of studying erosion around the world, studying geomorphic processes and, and looking at how um, landscapes evolve, in particular how erosion initiates channels and so forth. Uh, I had the opportunity, as many of us in the field do, to work in various parts of the world. And I started to notice connections that landscapes where the soils were pretty degraded, the, the populations are pretty impoverished as well. Um, and I spent, spent a lot of time in the last, well, since then, uh, digging into uh, thinking about how the way that, that agriculture affects the land ends up affects, affecting people. And you can think of that, the dirt book, you can, I like to think of these as all little mini PhD projects in terms of research effort and, and synthesis and communication. But the dirt book is essentially the one that looks backwards at history. It's the one you might expect a geomorphologist to write about soils and agriculture. Um, the Hidden Half of Nature that I wrote with Anne, uh, my wife, uh, Blader, uh, basically looks at the science uh, behind how the connections that I was sort of realizing in writing dirt work and the role of microbial life in maintaining soil fertility and agricultural productivity. And Growing a Revolution looked at trying to take some of the lessons from that first book and the science in the second book and ask the question of how practical is it to actually um, build a regenerative style of agriculture that could rebuild the health and fertility of agricultural land. And then What's Your Food Ate, the new book with the big cover over there that since it came out just most recently in June, looks at the connections to human health, uh, how soil health affects human health. There's a lot of dots to connect in between those. And then I tried to basically go through and connect those dots. But what this represents is a, a series, it's, it's almost like an intellectual journey to use sort of a hackneyed phrase, um, but it's a very real one where my thought processes in going from looking at how people affect the land to then how the land really affects not just whole societies, but our individual health. It was, it was the arc of this. So let me get started and I'll sort of take you through the summary of the first uh, three books fairly relatively briefly. I'll dwell a little bit more on dirt because it's the most geomorphic. Um, and then at the end, um, we'll get to what I hope you'll find is sort of an optimistic story, not just about the, the fate of agricultural lands, but also about the value of interdisciplinary perspectives and the way and, and about how thinking um, sort of outside one's field can lead to interesting connections with other fields. Um, so with the dirt book, that was the one that I started looking at. I thought I was writing a history of soil erosion. I, um, I had written a book about the environmental history of salmon before that king of fish that got at least sold well enough, not great, but well enough that a publisher approached me about, well, what's your next book? I'd never thought about doing a second book. Um, and so I pitched, I pitched dirt and they, they went with that. Um, well, not the first publisher, but someone thought that it was worthwhile thinking about how soil erosion affected human societies. And I dug back into that story and it's one that is of contemporary interest as well. And so it's not just a story about ancient history, because if you read the UN's global state of the soil assessment from a few years back to 2015, we're losing about 0.3% of our global food production capacity each year due to soil loss, soil erosion, and soil degradation, um, dominantly the loss of soil organic matter and the degradation of soil fertility. And that 0.3% is well, it's not fast enough that the, the problem of land degradation has ever really risen to the top of the policy agenda for, for any politician I know of. Um, but it's a pace that's fast enough that you know geomorphologists and geologists can appreciate that if you let that play out for the rest of this century, it adds up to close to another third of the world's agricultural land that would be degraded at this pace. And by most estimates, we've degraded somewhere between a quarter and a third of the world's agricultural land already in a fairly serious fashion in a way that it affects agricultural productivity. 
And what I learned in, in researching the dirt book and looking back through the history of ancient societies was that soil erosion and degradation played a role in the demise of societies reaching all the way back to um, the, the earliest agricultural societies in the Middle East, uh, Neolithic or Bronze Age Europe, Greece, Rome, Southern United States, uh, parts of Central America and more. And the basic idea that soil erosion affected past societies is not a new one. You can go back and find, you know, even the classical Greek philosopher Plato wrote about the, the kind of connections where he was looking about at the Bronze Age soil erosion event and recognizing signs of it in the Greek landscape. Um, but what I think I found that was very interesting was that if you look in most environmental history textbooks, the uh, the culprit behind the, the erosion that has been attributed to have, have affected past societies was almost always identified as deforestation, cutting down trees. Uh, and I think it was a little more complicated than that and a little more interesting because as I, the more I looked into the archaeological evidence from the different all these areas around the world, a common pattern started to emerge that in terms of it wasn't just cutting trees down, it wasn't just the axe, but it was the plow that followed that was really the instrument that set up the loss of soils. And I think you know, this crowd can really appreciate why that is because tillage, the act of inverting the soil, uh, leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to erosion by water or wind after plowing. It fundamentally alters the balance between soil production and soil erosion on the lands that societies were needing to feed themselves. Why? Because a vegetation cover can greatly decrease the pace of soil erosion. Um, you know, this is not a mystery to us in geomorphology, um, but it's something that plays out over a longer period, enough period of time can actually add up to major impacts on um, not just a single farm field, but whole regions and whole societies. Um, and so what I basically came away with in writing dirt was I thought I was going to write a history of soil erosion. And I ended up writing a history of farming because that was essentially the vector, the agent that was causing most of the erosion, that set up the processes that caused the erosion that had uh, rippled up to affect past societies. And I like to show this slide for general audience uh, talks because it illustrates pretty well why a geomorphologist or a geologist would look at a freshly plowed field after a rainstorm like this one in eastern Washington and go, my God, that's an erosional disaster. Um, but to an agronomist, those rills can be erased with a single pass of the plow. It's not a challenge to, to manage that on an annual basis. You can just like plow, you know, plow right over them, they disappear. But if they keep forming year after year, uh, and I should note that this is a wheat field, but it's a wheat field in the uh, winter wheat fallow rotation, typical of East conventional farming in Eastern Washington. And why am I showing Washington state slides? I find it's better to pick on my own home state than other parts around the world. Um, when I'm talking about erosional disasters. Um, and this, to me, looks like an erosional disaster. To many people, um, it would look like, oh, well, okay, that, that, that's sort of a small problem. Those are like little thin, uh, you know, they're not very deep. They're um, sure they're all over the place. How important are they? This slide is another slide from the Palouse that I like to use to drive the point home that they can be pretty darn important. Uh, this is a also winter wheat field. Uh, this uh, fence up here in the upper right hand corner is a fence that a farmer built around their water cistern back uh, first in 1911 when the ground level was up here at that upper orange bar. Uh, and once it was uh, plowed, um, you know, uh, plowed for the first time, it was put into that winter wheat fallow rotation for 50 years until this photo was taken in 1961. And this little cliff had developed around the edge of this field where the, both the repeated active tillage was moving soil down slope and all those uh, little rills from um, rain that, that does happen occasionally in eastern Washington um, that was washing away soil if on an almost annual basis during the, during the fallow period. Uh, how high is this cliff? This little black line from here to here is a one foot increment on a stadia rod. That's about a five foot cliff. That's about five feet of topsoil loss in about 50 years. Um, and it's about you know, what, uh, a foot a decade, an inch a year, roughly. Or, um, that's an incredibly fast pace. That's faster than the pace of soil production that I know of that's been documented anywhere in the world. Now, this is also an extreme example. I hope you're sitting there thinking, well, this is at the top end of a field. The soil doesn't just disappear. It's moving down slope. Yeah, it's being reallocated. That's part of the, the name of the dirt book is soil out of place is dirt. Um, but essentially, um, this kind of example is an extreme one. And I like to use it because it's the most extreme photo I can find to drive that point home. Um, there's not a lot of places in the world where it's eroding quite that fast. Um, but 
so how about if we scale out to a, a broader area than one field? Um, this is some of uh, a map that's taken from Bob Mead's work back in the, the, the 1980s, looking at historical erosion in the Piedmont region of the American Southeast. So the area from the, the hill country stretching from Virginia up here in the upper right down to Alabama down there in the lower left. Um, that gray noodle is the area in which he was uh, mapped the ma amount of topsoil loss due to po uh, post uh, uh, post-European contact agricultural practices, so colonial erosion for the most part. And you notice that most of that gray noodle has lost four to 10 inches of topsoil. Uh, areas of it have lost more than 10 inches of topsoil. And one of the things I did in researching dirt is I went back and I, re I read the journals of um, and accounts from many of the early colonial farmers in this region about what their soil was like. And they reported having six to 12 inches, uh, for the most part, of fairly rich black earth over a reddish subsoil. Now, if you visit this area today, what you mostly find farmers working at the surface is that reddish subsoil. The topsoil is virtually gone across much of this region. Um, and Paul Beerman and, um, and his students at the University of Vermont have also done great work with cosmogenic isotopes, as, as other people have in the East Coast, that have essentially really reinforced uh, this view of major post-colonial or colonial era topsoil loss across this region. And if we, if, if, I like to drive this home on a regional level because if if we could have done this in in the U.S. and just with a couple hundred years of agricultural practices that weren't all that different than of the previous millennia dating back to classical Greece in terms of the world part of the world where tillage was was a regular occurrence, think what they could have done with a in Greece with a thousand year run at southern Greece or a thousand year run at, at central Italy. It, it starts to put into perspective the idea that agricultural practices if maintaining a negative balance of soil production, in other words, net soil loss, maintained for long enough, you can literally burn through the entire topsoil. Um, and so as part of what I did in researching dirt is I basically you know, read the agricultural literature, tried to put these stories together from around the world, but I also wanted to find data to look at, well, okay, what is really the pace of global soil loss off of agricultural fields? So I went to the library for a few months one summer um, and compiled data from about 1,400 different studies of what are the, what are the pace of agricultural soil erosion or, uh, and, and, uh, from fields around the world that were uh, tilled and then also no-till fields. Uh, what are natural rates of erosion in alpine or glaciated terrain, soil mantled uplands, and low gradient cratonic cre environments, sort of tr trying to stratify by rough tectonic um, uh, area region. And you'll notice that there's what, uh, one, two, three, four, six or seven orders of magnitude across the range of erosion rates that we find on Earth. And I like to play the game of, you know, okay, in terms of agricultural erosion, where in the world is it most like the natural rates of erosion? And, you know, the conclusion I drew from this graph is, well, it's mostly like high mountains. We've managed to turn places where we farm, which tend to look more like Kansas than they do like the Himalaya, um, into places that erode more like the Himalaya than Kansas. Um, and that's, and I did not in this, this study include any database and sediment yields or U.S. or, or model estimates. These are all, um, you know, losses. Um, that are erosional losses and published it in PNAS back in 2007, the same time the dirt book came out. Uh, and the basic uh, story is one in which if you take rates of natural soil production that was compiled at the time, and I'd love to see somebody recompile and add more data to this, um, long-term rates of geological erosion, looking at the, the probability distribution functions here, uh, erosion rates under native vegetation, and erosion rates under conservation agriculture or no-till agriculture and other styles of conservation agriculture, they all pretty much plot on top of each other. What plots differently, you know, in order of magnitude or two out, are rates of agricultural erosion uh, on conventionally plowed and conventionally uh, fertilized um, uh, fields. There's something different about agriculture uh, that's causing you know, erosion at a pace that's far greater than uh, paces of natural soil building or erosion under natural conditions. Um, and I also want to point out that this red bar across here, that's the rate that those are rates of soil loss the USDA considers acceptable uh, under uh, farming systems. And I'd like to note also that the median pace of soil erosion around the world from agricultural fields was higher than the high end of an acceptable soil loss rate of a millimeter a year, according to the USDA. In other words, Houston, we have a planetary scale problem in terms of our agricultural erosion. We're losing soil faster than nature can, re, re, um, can replenish it. Now, the problem isn't necessarily that we farm. That was, that was sort of the good news of the, this particular story, is when we look at uh, 
what we have here is uh, of all that data in places where we had uh, data for both long-term natural erosion rates and agricultural erosion rates, what's the fact, the human increase factor? That, and so you can think of these as a you know, percentage increase, 100% um, would be a doubling. Um, and, and so basically what, uh, we have essentially, um, it's not not percent. Sorry, it's a hundred times. So it's basically have a cross, a basically one to two order of magnitude increase in agricultural erosion rate off of plowed fields relative to natural rates. But over here on the right hand side is the no till decrease factor. For the few studies, I think it was about forty studies or so that I was able to find at the time, where people documented rates of erosion under conventional agriculture and then also under no till agriculture. No till was able to decrease erosion rates by about as much as the tillage increased in the first place. In other words. The problem is not that we farm, it's how we farm. And this was an eye opener to me in terms of thinking about, oh, okay, if we're interested in erosion and agricultural sustainability, um, maybe we should be looking at different styles of farming practices. Um, this is just a table that shows you the data that from behind that PNAS paper that I compiled where um, looking at conventional agriculture, the median global erosion rate was about a millimeter and a half per year. Uh, you look down at no-till agriculture, it's less than a millimeter a year. Um, and if you looked at native vegetation, global soil production, or long-term geological erosion rates with the median from around the world, they're all sort of a fraction of a millimeter a year. The big point I'd like to make here is that red number is a lot bigger than the blue numbers um, by an order of magnitude or two, um, depending on how far you want to push that. But the basic the basic story uh, that it came away with from uh, this, uh, the, the data compilation that, that accompanied DIRT was that, that soils are eroding off of conventionally managed farms around the world an average rate roughly a millimeter and a half a year. At that pace, it only takes about 20 years to erode an inch of topsoil. How fast does nature make soil? At the time, the soil production uh, numbers that I was able to compile uh, suggested that about you know two percent of a millimeter a year is a decent global average. At that pace, it takes a thousand years or so to make an inch topsoil, um, and obviously those time scales are a little out of whack. Um, but what I found really interesting about that uh, was when you take that and compare it back to the agri the archaeological record, that that roughly. Um, uh, if you look at how fast at a net soil loss of a millimeter a year or so would take to strip a typical half meter to one meter thick topsoil off of the hillside, it's going to be roughly 500 to 1,000 years. And if you look back in the archaeological record, that's approximately the time span of most major agricultural civilizations outside of major river floodplains. Because I hope you're sitting there thinking of, well, you know, They've been farming along the Nile for thousands of years, 7,000 or something like that. Uh, the, and on long Tigris and Euphrates, they've been farming it for a long time. The Indus and, and the Brahmaputra in India, the big rivers of lowland China, all places where civilizations and societies have managed to farm for a long, much longer than this 500 to 1,000 year kind of time frame. But those places all share a physical geography of being major river floodplains. And what happens in big river floodplains? Well, floods. There's and there, there's a replenishment of the mineral mineralogical component of soils on an annual or near annual basis. That at a pace, if you think of um, that millimeter a year average pace of topsoil erosion off of plowed or tilled fields, you could basically replace that with a single single grain of sand every year, and you're keeping up with it. So uh, I like to think of these uh, sort of civilizations that thrived in deltaic or uh, big river estuary environments for long or long major uh, alluvial rivers for a long time as the exception that kind of helps reinforce the rule that when you look outside of societies and major river floodplains, societies that intensively farmed using methods that rendered the soil vulnerable to erosion, if it would, they were maintained for centuries, they could degrade the land enough to actually affect those societies. Uh, and uh, it's always very nice to have uh, other folks come along and uh, make basically make the case you made. Uh, uh, and I'll show you. There's a couple. Uh, the basic argument that I and arguments that I put together in Dirt that were mostly based on reviews of other people's studies because that's what you do when you write a book like that. Uh, there's been other studies that have come out since then that have really reinforced that point. Um, for example, in classical Greece, where I argued that there's uh, you know, been several rounds of major erosional events uh, beginning in the, the Bronze Age, um, uh, Rothker et al. in 2018 wrote a paper that basically documented that, that in, in a particular late core, I, I used a lot of archaeological data and evidence, they came up with a very similar story uh, and argued that it was one of the, an, er, one, an early example of a negative feedback where societies, the way they treated the land influenced the, the longevity of that civilization. Uh, basically the story I told in DIRT. Um, 
Yenny et al. in a paper in uh, 2019 argued that um, there was a big increase in human driven soil erosion starting around 4,000 years ago in the Bronze Age, uh, and that in watersheds where agriculture uh, came in, uh, erosion rates increased, and that there's uh, roughly a little more than a third of the watersheds they looked at had major increases in soil erosion as attributed to human activity, which translates into farming. Um, Kemp et al. Uh, in uh, 2020, the next year, and these are all sort of a series of recent papers that have reinforced the points in dirt, uh, looking at sediment transfer and storage across North America, uh, basically argued that there was a tenfold increase in agriculture and, and river uh, erosion uh, associated with that increase in agriculture. And most recently, um, uh, uh, Thaler and, and, and Larson and, and colleagues at, um, at uh, UMass Amherst have been looking at uh, topsoil erosion rate in the American Midwest uh, and documented erosion, average erosion rates uh, post uh, European contact. So under modern conventional farming that are virtually identical to the pay, to the rates that I came up with as global averages, uh, you know, roughly millimeter and a half pushing two millimeters in their case, but with big error bars because it's, it's highly variable. And they're also finding that roughly a third of the area across the corn belt of the US Midwest has completely lost its A horizon. So the story of dirt, what's happened in the past, is not just ancient history. It's happening on farms around the, all around the world today at paces that are comparable to what happened in the past um, and that have created problems for societies in the past. Um, but it's not just a problem of soil loss and soil erosion. As, as near and dear to my heart as studying soil erosion is, um, a big part of the agricultural problem is turning soils like this on the left into soils like that on the right. This example is from a pair of fields in North Carolina in that gray noodle from Bob Mead's work uh, that shows you uh, uh, what a, uh, the soil at a modern conventional tobacco plantation looks like. And it looks like you know salty California beach sand. Um, and in part, that's because it is beach sand. It's Miocene age beach sand. Uh, it's 10 million year old beach sand, uh, but it's pretty much devoid of organic matter. A Cent couple centuries of conventional farming have really you know, almost virtually destroyed the soil in terms of its fertility. The soil on the left is literally from across the fence line uh, on, a, on an area of, of forest that had been a farm up until the mid 19th century. Uh, when the first round of land degradation helped to drive uh, farmers from the East Coast across the Appalachians and set up thing, helped set up things like the American Civil War, go into all that in the dirt book. But the point here being that century and a half of forest has essentially recovered the organic matter content of the soil. The color difference is pretty much organic matter. Um, there you can see visible organic matter, but the, the, the color difference is the you know, soil organic matter difference. Um, and this, this change um, from turning this kind of soil that's more like what the native soil was like into um, what the soil is like on f today is a change that's happened on farms around the world and it's gone great, mostly un really commented on or noticed, but it's at a large scale and it's an important problem. Uh, Baumhardt et al. In, in the journal Sustainability a few years back uh, basically studied the law, historical loss of soil organic matter in North American farmland soils and they found that the at levels have been re on, at, reduced on average by about 50% relative to what they were when the farms were first converted from forests or prairies. In other words, we've run down the organic matter batteries of uh, agricultural land, at least across the U.S. by 50%. And as I've looked into it, it looks like numbers globally are pretty similar in terms of turning soils that used to have four, five, six, eight percent organic matter into soils that have one, two, three percent organic matter. There's been a major lo a loss of not only soils around the world through erosion, but of soil organic matter and the attendant fertility that um, it helps to, to engender. So that ends the totally depressing part of the talk, uh, because uh, one of the things that I ran into in thinking about uh, this problem of land degradation and soil erosion was the question of, well, is soil restoration possible? Could we actually reverse the historical pattern of decline that has affected societies around the world time and again through history? Uh, and can we avoid their fate in terms of our global civilization at this point? Um, and that's where I started to turn into an optimist. And that's what Anne and I started to write about in The Hidden Half of Nature, because I ended up doing a whole lot of uh, some observations and fieldwork in a place where I had never really worked before. That was my own backyard. 
um, because I, I had the, fort the fortune to marry a, a um, gardener who's also, uh, also a biologist and a very good writer, and uh, she wanted a garden. We'd lived in, when we were living in student housing, she would always, you know, like terraform wherever the front part was that we could we actually have access to. And we bought a house in Seattle. Um, she wanted a garden. We had soil, however, when we took the lawn off the part that she wanted to garden that looked like this. It looked like that um, uh, tobacco plantation from North Carolina. It had less than 1% organic matter. Um, it, was, it, was, it was dirt. It was not very good soil. There wasn't a single worm in the lawn beneath our, 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 our yard. And Anne took it on herself uh, to basically compost and mulch the hell out of it for a number of years. And we started to see the soil start to change fairly rapidly um, and start to get dark. This is the soil that we have at that place today um, where it's pushing 8%, 10% organic matter. And in about that transition happened over a little more than a decade. Um, and the garden is thriving, plants are thriving, but seeing the soil go from a degraded state to a very rich state uh, in terms of fertility in on a time scale of a decade or so really jolted me because i've been looking back at processes that played out over centuries in terms of land degradation and the idea that it might be possible to reverse this process fairly quickly was kind of an eye-opener even though you know you can think lots of compost lots of mulch sure you're going to increase your organic matter content but the question was sort of that came to mind was how is it working what's the trick behind it because you know if you could do this on farms while they're still managing to be intensive farms it could really make a difference and that led us to thinking about the soil food web and where Anne's biology really came in um, to the partnership in terms of thinking about these issues because we were adding compost and mulch to the soil and but it was breaking down through the action of the bacteria and fungi in the soil um, and the microarthropods and nematodes and protozoa that would eat the bacteria and fungi and the whole sort of nutrient cycling system in the soil. It turns out that they were the parties that were really responsible for building the soil organic matter and for breaking it down, liberating elements that the plants could take back up to nourish themselves, but also leaving some of that carbon in the soil to provide fuel for the microbial world, which was functioning as, in effect, a biological bazaar. So as Anne and I got more into thinking about, well, what is the life in the soil doing for soil fertility and how is that related to building soil organic matter and reversing the declines that I wrote about in dirt, we ran into the world known as the rhizosphere, which is literally, clearly Greek for the zone around the roots of a plant. And we were fascinated by uh, studies that found things like that plants that are reducing exudates into the soil. And we all know that plants will take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, merge it with water through photosynthesis to build their bodies. But how many of us really recognize that most plants will, will exude out of their roots anywhere from a quarter to upwards of a third, and by some estimates, even close to half for certain plants in certain environments, of all that material that they've made through photosynthesis, the whole energetic investment in that, and they'll just exude it out of their roots into the soil. It's kind of like if we, any one of us would take, you know, a third or half of our annual salary and just routinely leave it on a street corner every week to, for whoever would like to come by and get it. Uh, plant, those exudates don't make it very far from the roots of a plant. They make it about a millimeter to a centimeter into the soil before they're consumed by some other organism. And if you look around the roots of a, of a, of a healthy plant, in healthy soil. It's one of the most life dense areas on the planet, full of bacteria and fungi that are congregating there to consume those exudates. And so why would the plant do this? It's not just to be friends with the microbes in the soil. Um, they're doing it because they get something in return, because those microbes will consume the plant exudates. And what does an organism do that consumes something? It uh, metabolizes it and their metabolites or the waste products and those microbes are right around the roots of a plant. And when Ann and I found studies uh, that documented that plants, plant exudates were being converted by soil bacteria into plant growth promoting hormones that the plant would then take back up that would enhance its biomass so it could fix more carbon, so it could produce more exudates, feed more microbes, we recognized, oh, that's a positive feedback. Uh, in terms of fungi in the soil, what can't they not do? They can't photosynthesize. They rely on consuming uh, dead or decaying things. Uh, but they also are very good at, at prospecting for things like phosphorus um, or, or, or mineral elements out of soil particles. And many fungi, mycorrhizal fungi in particular, will uh, partner with plants where they'll grow and intertwine with their roots. And the fungi will provide the plants with mineral elements that are, it needs for growth and health. And what does the fungi get? 
a cut of those sugary exudates, food in other words. So there's this rich biological bazaar that has symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationships that are every bit as highly evolved as what's going on in the world above ground that we know between say like pollinators and, and flowers, um, where we can see it with our own senses. But these, these mutually beneficial relationships that are happening in the soil are happening in the hidden half of nature, out of sight, out of mind. But what Wayne and I learned in researching and writing that book is just how important that life is to building and maintaining soil organic matter and soil fertility, and therefore farming. Um, and it raised the question when we, uh, you know, of it's one thing to be able to restore the soil in an urban environment where you have access to coffee grounds from Starbucks and zoo do from the city zoo, and you can probably guess what zoo do is. Um, you know, it's one uh, thing to be able to do that in an urban environment. But what about on an active productive, economically viable farm. And that's the question I tried to wrestle with in Growing a Revolution, where I visited farms around the world that had turned soil like this khaki stuff into soil like this dark stuff, and tried to ask the farmers, you know, what did you do? What were the practices that allowed you to do that? How long, what was the time scale involved? What happened to your crop yields? What did you use in terms of pesticides, fertilizers, and so forth? Basically, how did you restore your soil? So I, I took about six months to go and visit farmers in uh, Equatorial Africa, Central America, and across North America, um, who had been uh, very early adopters of regenerative farming practices, soil building farming practices, um, and had converted conventional farms and radically restored their soil. And what I found was that what they had in common was three these three principles that um, they shared. Now, the farmers in, you know, subsistence farmers in Equatorial Africa were using very different practices than say, farmers in the Dakotas on very large spreads, um, but they all shared uh, practices that hit on these three principles, minimal or no disturbance of the soil. So it was generally no-till farming, uh, minimal use of chemicals, minimal use of, uh, of tillage, uh, so minimal chemical and physical disturbance, and no-till is the best example of that. If you're not tilling, you're not disturbing the soil. Um, made, they maintained a permanent ground cover. Uh, they noticed they planted cover crops. They always had something, a living plant in the, in the um, uh, field at a time. And they planted diverse crop rotations. They didn't just grow corn and soybeans, for example, to pick on one non-rotation. Um, so what is it about this combination of minimal disturbance, both chemical and physical, keeping a ground cover that could provide carbon to the, to the soil, essentially when those cover crops are, are, um, are allowed to basically rot back on the field, uh, and having a diverse community of plants. It translates into a healthy, diverse community of soil life because you're basically not disturbing them. So it's housing, it's food in terms of, of carbon back in the ground, and it's a community to actually interact with. Um, so this is a rest, this, these principles, practices based on these principles are a recipe for cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. And that's essentially the key to rebuilding healthy, fertile soils on, on fairly short timeframes. What does that look like in practice? Uh, I'm going to show you a couple examples of restored soils. This is from David Brandt's farm in Carroll, Ohio. He grows wheat, corn, and soybeans for the North American commodity crop markets, but that's not all that he grows. He also plants, uh, aggressively plants lots of cover crops in between his crops, it, both in his rotation and sometimes with between his rows. This is the soil he started with back in 1971. It's the soil, uh, this picture is the soil from his neighbor's farm right across the street, uh, but very similar to what he started with back in the early 70s. He went to no-till for a decade or two, then started doing cover crops. Then he added um, um, diversity to his cover crops. This is soil today. It has more carbon in it than the native soil from the, the bit, scraps of native forest around his farm. They're still left in places. Um, and so he's gone from less than 2% to about, I think it's like 6 or 7% organic matter in this case. He roughly tripled his soil organic, topsoil organic matter over the course of a few decades. And he's made, as a consequence, he's weaned himself off of fertilizers and pesticides almost completely. These two soils are uh, in the hands of Gabe Brown, a, a rancher from North Dakota who also has um, uh, also grows crops. Uh, the soil that he's holding up, the, the black one, that's from his market garden plot that's received the most sort of regenerative attention from him. Uh, and the soil on his left is from the neighboring organic farm. The neighboring organic farm is pretty decent soil for that area but you can see the color difference for yourself in terms of what a decade or so of um, the, the practices following those, those regenerative practices lead to. Um, again, and Gabe's got his soil back up to about a 6% organic matter, averaged across his 5,000-ish acre farm, if I'm remembering the numbers right, 
um, which is you know, two to three times his neighbors. Uh, this is a soil from uh, uh, Singing Frogs Farm, the, the Kaiser's Farm in Sebastopol, California. The soil on the right is their soil uh, that is pushing 10% organic matter, um, if I remember the numbers right. Uh, the soil on the left is their neighbor, is a, from a neighboring vineyard. It's hard, hard as a rock. It's the same soil, same topographic position, same climate, same parent material. The only difference is how it's been farmed. And in this case, this is about a 10 year, 12 year difference because the Kaisers only started farming about 12 years ago, if I recall right. Uh, this transformation, in other words, from relatively infertile soil to very healthy fertile soil can happen remarkably fast um, if one's farming practices change. But what are some of the benefits of healthy fertile soil? The one I like to put at the top is higher farmer profits. And why is, are these regenerative practices generating higher profits? Because farmers are able to maintain their yields and use less fertilizer, pesticide, and fossil fuel. Every farmer I visited who had, uh, was in the westernized world, sort of in the, in the input or um, you know, pesticide, fertilizer, and fossil fuel intensive farming practices, had cut their uh, uh, fossil fuel use by at least 50%. Uh, why? Because they're not driving their tractors around as much. They're not doing as much tillage. Many of them had almost completely reduced their pesticide use, uh, and most of them had reduced their fertilizer uh, bill by at least 50%, and some by up to 90%. And I think I think Dave Brandt and Gabe Brown now have gone to the point where they're not using any nitrogen fertilizer. Why? They don't need it. It's a waste of money. They have really fertile soil that can generate yields that are comparable to their conventional neighbors. Um, and this also had side benefits of increased soil carbon, uh, better water retention, less offsite pollution. Simply put, the best way to prevent offsite leakage of nitrogen from farming is to use less soluble nitrogen fertilizer in the first place. And organic matter is rich in nitrogen, uh, and it's not terribly soluble. It's like a drip filter for nitrogen to crops. Uh, whereas, and it, you can build it up over season to season, year to year, which means a farmer can invest in building their soil fertility using practices that rebuild soil organic matter. Whereas soluble nitrogen fertilizers, you have to buy every year from your fertilizer dealer, and they're soluble, so they don't stick around. If you, any that your plant, your crops t don't take up this year, doesn't stick around next year. Instead, it ends up in somebody's water well, a river, or the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so there's some major benefits, um, and, and I could go on to list more in terms of what regenerative farming can do. Um, and you might be interested in the transition time to get yields back up to comparable to the conventional ones, and it looks like it's on the order of just a couple of years, uh, which actually is fairly uh, surprising to me. That brings us to the new book, What Your Food Ate, where Ann and I tried to delve into, okay, um, if we, what, are, what kind of difference can regenerative farming practices make to what's actually in our food? People have long argued since the 30s and 40s that soil health affects the health of crops, and that affects the health of animals and livestock, that, help, that affects the health of people. But there's been a lot of science done since the 40s, um, and we tried to synthesize that into looking at how the different differences between conventional agriculture that emphasize chemi soil chemistry and physics, of which there's nothing wrong with that, uh, unless you forget about soil biology and the, the role of soil life, which also really matters. And that's what regenerative agriculture does, is it, it emphasizes cultivating soil life. Uh, what, does, what kind of a difference can that make to what's actually in our food? Uh, well, first, what can it do to our soils? So as part of writing What Your Food Ate, um, uh, Ann and I uh, supervised a little experiment across the United States where we looked at 10 paired farms, regenerative farm and a neighboring conventional farm, where we had the farmers grow the same crop in the same year, you know, in the same local environment, uh, and we then went and tested their soils and we tested their crops. Uh, and here is showing you the difference in between their soils. And the regenerative farmers were farmers that had been practicing that combination of no-till, cover crops, and diverse rotations for between five and ten years of all three. Some of them had been no-till for much longer, um, but they had only been using that combination of all three practices based on all three principles for five to 10 years. And their conventional neighbors were typical for their using conventional practices typical of their area. And what this shows you in terms of the, the, the box and whisker plots is soil organic matter on the left. The regenerative farmers had you know, roughly twice as much topsoil organic matter. Um, and we were just measuring the upper eight inches and you know, why aren't we doing the full soil profile? And we had actually a, you know, a minimal number of samples. Well, this is a shoestring budget project. Um, they imagine going to like an agricultural funder as a geomorphologist and say you want um, uh, funding anyway. Uh, it was a shoestring budget, small numbers, but very interesting results. 
Factor two, increase in soil organic matter for the regenerative uh, farms over the conventional ones. And the Haney test over here is a test of uh, uh, soil health. It, it's basically a soil health score. It integrates soil organic matter. So there's a little redundancy between the plots, but it also integrates microbial activity, uh, abundance and um, activity. And the soil health scores in the regenerative farms are roughly three times what they were in the conventional ones. So those anecdotal examples of a couple farms with a nice colored soil differences, it seems to be fairly generalizable that with, in the course of order of a decade or so, you can really move the dial at least on the topsoil in terms of soil organic matter by adopting practices that follow these principles. Uh, but what does that do for the crops? And what does it do for the, what gets into the crops? Well, one of the take home messages that Dan and I took from writing The Hidden Half of Nature is that you can think about a plant as having a diet. Uh, and there's two very different sort of end member diets you can think of in terms of what the soil is feeding plants. And we, can, we call one the fertilizer diet. And we know that you can grow you know, high yields of crops if you give them a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the NPK of agronomy. Um, but what you'll find is that those plants grown in degraded soils where you've, you fertilize them to maintain um, yields, they don't invest so much in their roots. Uh, and that means they're not investing so much in exudates. And that means they're not investing so much in recruiting microbial partners in the soil. That means they're not getting as much in the way of mineral micronutrients, things like phosphorus and iron and zinc and copper. Uh, and the latter ones, things that you know plants don't need much of, but they need that little bit an awful lot, and so do we. And where do we get it? From our diet, from the crops that got it out of the soil in the first place. And so on a fertilizer diet, plants aren't getting as many helpful microbial metabolites. Um, whereas on a soil health diet with a, a much uh, expanded root system, more investment in exudates, uh, plants don't need as much of, in terms of an external input of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, uh, and they're getting more micronutrients and beneficial microbial metabolites. But what does that look like in terms of what they're getting? Well, things like iron and zinc. There's uh, lots of studies that have looked at the connection between uh, how is it that, that plants access the mineral elements that are locked up in soil particles. And it's generally, there's sort of two pathways. One is just whatever's dissolved in the water in the soil, plants will take it up through the roots like straws. And you know, I was trained to think of roots as straws in, in essence. Um, but there's also um, gene pathways in most crops that relate to exudate production that, are, uh, that can feed mycorrhizal fungi in particular that will go prospect for things like zinc. So at there, when one looks at soil tests, for example, if you just look at the, the plant available minerals in a, that in a soluble form in the soil, what all conventional tests do, they don't actually measure what a fungi can get out of a soil particle and trade to a plant in that biological bazaar, which often leads to the recommendation to over fertilize and add micronutrients to soils that are devoid of soil life because the plants partners that used to provide them with those things are, are essentially um, down on their luck or missing. Um, another thing that, that the relationship to soil life uh, helps uh, plants produce are phytochemicals. And that's another one of those words that the meaning is hidden right there in the title, phytoplant chemicals, plant-made chemicals. Uh, those are things like uh, the linalool that's in lavender, that, uh, part of what gives it that smell that some people like. Um, but it also has health benefits when it gets into our diet. Sulforaphane, um, it's in brassicas, cauliflowers and broccoli and so forth, has documented anti-cancer properties. Um, curcum curcumin, uh, stuff in turmeric as well, documented anti-cancer properties. But plants aren't producing phytochemicals to help our health when we eat them. They're doing it for their own purposes. And that is phytochemicals are essentially their health plan, their defense plan. Uh, for example, when certain insect herbivores will nibble on a plant, um, that plant can send out um, signals into the soil, um, phytochemicals into the soil that will trigger certain, that will attract certain microbes that will metabolize those phytochemicals, produce um, compounds, metabolites that the plant can take back up that will repel that particular insect pest. There's this whole language of chemistry going on between plants and soil life that is essentially turns out to be integral to the health and defense of crops. And it kind of makes sense because think about the defense mechanisms of a plant. They're rooted, they're stuck in place, they can't go anywhere. Um, and so their, their whole repertoire in terms of health and defense is chemical and they've offshored via exudates some of the production of, of things that will help them maintain their health and defense. 
and some of the stimulation of interactions with microbial life will compel will will uh, trigger plants to make phytochemicals that bolster or maintain their health. So phytochemicals in response to, to soil life is is a key connection. But how does this relate to human health? Well, if we look over the last century or so, or last 50 years, we become very good as societies at reducing the incidence of infectious diseases, you know, up until the current uh, ongoing pandemic, of course. Um, but, you know, basically we don't suffer today from, uh, as, a, as populations, from maladies that our great grandparents really feared and worried about. Uh, instead, today, what's happened is the incidence of chronic diseases have gone through the roof. And many chronic diseases are rooted in the process of inflammation of our own immune system gone awry. Um, and seven out of 10 of us in the United States today uh, will, are, um, you know, we're dying of prematurely of chronic diseases that are many of which are rooted in inflammation. Um, and that brings us to thinking about, oh, well, what is in our food that might actually kind of relate to that? So one of the things that Ann and I did then published in one of those Frontiers journals uh, last year was a, uh, that's research for the book is that we compared, we read all the studies that we could find where people had looked at what's in crops, the nutrient density in terms of minerals, in terms of phytochemicals, um, in terms of vitamins. And what we were able to find uh, was that it's complicated that you probably all probably have seen headlines every other year of like organic foods better. Or, no, it's not. It's no different. Um, the sort of the intellectual badminton that goes on in the medical world about that. But what I found most interesting is when you really read that and digest that whole literature, um, there's some in interesting definitional issues going on because uh, people are defining nutrition in different ways that lead them to their conclusions. Uh, so what, I bas what we basically found is that in general, the, the takeaways that you can have uh, make have are that there don't appear to be real big differences between organic and conventional foods in terms of their basic uh, chemical makeup, their, their, sort of their macro chemistry, shall we say. Um, there's some, but not, not, not consistent. But what uh, consistently organic crops tend to contain more micronutrients, uh, well, most consistently more phytochemicals. They tend to contain more micronutrients, but not always. But every study we found that compared phytochemicals, the organic crops had much higher levels, like 20, 25% or more to order, you know, orders of magnitude higher in some cases. Uh, and also consistently conventional crops had more pesticides and heavy metals. Again, no, no real uh, surprise there. One could argue about whether those are dangerous levels or not. That's still being debated in the, in the medical sciences. But what I found was most interesting is like, what is it about organic farming practices that would lead to more micronutrients and consistently more phytochemicals? And that, again, I think relates back to um, the health of the soil and what's happening in terms of microbial life. But I've also been to enough organic farms that plow a lot that they don't have terribly good soil. So we started, to, and I started thinking about, well, what about comparing regenerative farms, some of these farms where the soils have been restored very much, and looking at some of the crops and what's grown in them. And we did two, two experiments for the book, uh, mo both just oppor opportunistic experiments. This is the most opportunistic. There was a wheat field in Northern Oregon where uh, the farmer had, uh, uh, he wanted to know whether or not he could cut back on his uh, herbicide use and still maintain his crop yields. So he wanted to compare their conventional um, um, winter wheat uh, no-till with a glyphosate uh, fallow, so spraying lots of herbicide on it, uh, with a neighboring field where he basically didn't spray any herbicide, he didn't plow, uh, and he grew cover crops um, uh, for two years, a diverse mix of cover crops. And then he sent us samples of his wheat. We tested them on the mass spec down in oceanography here at UW. And what I show you is sort of the full mineral panel here that they ran and focus first on, well, on the right-hand column, it's the ratio of the amount of that mineral uh, in the cover crop versus the conventional. So think regenerative over, uh, over conventional. Notice first the, the red numbers. Those are all the ones where the conventional crop had more of those elements, sodium, nickel, and cadmium. Is that stuff you want in your food? Uh -uh. The other stuff, it's all good, all better in terms of the regenerative. Oh, I like to just drop your attention to zinc down there. 56% more zinc in the wheat grown on the cover cropped, um, uh, the diverse cover cropped field after two years. Now, they weren't adding zinc to the soil. You can't 
you can't raise the zinc content of the soil that fast, especially if you're not adding zinc. So what's happening? Uh, well, what you can change that fast is soil life, the mycorrhizal fungi abundance, the prospectors for the zinc. So I think what this, this, this experiment showed, although indirectly, since we didn't measure the microbial activity, I think it put the, the microbial miners and truckers back on the job getting zinc into the crops. Um, and we also did remember that 10 farm comparison. Uh, we also did a comparison of, um, you know, crops grown on those 10 farms and then looked at the ratios of those, the farms, the regenerate, the amount in the regenerative crop versus the neighboring conventional crop, and then looked at the averages of those ratios. And that gave us, you know, increases in phytochemicals on the order of 20% or so of carotenoids, phenolics, phytosterols. Uh, these are all things that have been shown in the medical literature to have positive effects on human health. Uh, and a number of vitamins we also found sort of fairly large differences in, you know, from 14 to 34% differences in certain vitamins. Minerals were really all over the map um, in terms of this comparison. The biggest differences we found turned out to be kind of similar to the differences that we found in the review of organic versus conventional practices. And what's the commonality between regenerative and organic practices? Soil health tends to be better than in conventional systems. And we did one small comparison in terms of what this meant for um, uh, what's in uh, livestock as well, uh, where uh, these two graphs are showing comparisons of total omega-3 fat content uh, and the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fats uh, in beef and pork that were um, grown either or raised either on a regenerative farm, Gabe Brown's farm, that one that I showed you with the really rich black soil, and conventional store-bought um, uh, feedlot-fed beef. And why the differences here? Well, first of all, why are we looking at omega-6s and 3s? Because omega-6 fats are fats that your body uses to help initiate inflammation, and omega-3 fats are integral to terminating inflammation. They share biochemical pathways in the human body, so if you have far more omega-6s in your diet than omega-3s, your body is teed up to promote inflammation and has a hard time quelling it. If you have a lot of omega-3s, um, it's going to be easier for your body to quell inflammation. So the connection here is back to inflammation. Uh, and you'll notice that the regenerative beef and the regenerative pork had several fold more omega-3s and omega-6s. In terms of the ratio of omega-3s to 6s, the conventional uh, meats had, you know, six times to 25 times the omega-6s than the omega-3s. The regenerative stuff was down here at about one, close to one to one for beef and about six to one for pork. Uh, what's optimal for the human diet? The medical sciences will say between about one and four. Um, in other words, we're seeing difference, and the differences here are um, basically whether or not the animal, in this case cows and pigs, are eating grains, which are full of omega-6s in conventional feedlots, because that's what uh, the feedlot rations tend to be made out of, um, all that excess uh, corn and soy that we produce. Uh, and the omega, the regenerative uh, animals were pasture grazed, they're eating leafy green plants. Why are those full of omega-3s? Because omega-3s are involved in photosynthesis. So they're in leafy green plants. Seeds are different, they're full of omega-6s. What we feed our animals influences what gets into what we eat in ways that can influence levels of inflammation in our diet, we believe. So basically we're getting to the end here where, you know, what we basically found in looking at uh, uh, researching what your food ate is it looks like regenerative farming, and we define regenerative farming as farming practices that can increase and maintain um, the, uh, the health and fertility of the soil. So increasing soil organic matter or maintaining a, a healthy soil life once you sort of saturate the soil for that particular climate and farming system with organic matter because you can't just keep raising organic matter forever. Um, but the regenerative farming soil building practices can increase topsoil organic matter at a pace that's, you know, frankly, pretty shockingly fast. You know, we're talking decades, not centuries to do that um, and do it on full scale profitable operating farms, not just a backyard garden. Uh, regenerative farming can increase phenolics, phytosterols, and carotenoids in crops. Um, and actually, yesterday at the doctor's office, my doctor was saying, well, you know, you could be helped by more uh, phytosterols. And I was like, yeah, I, I know, I've looked into it. <laughs> um, the In terms of vitamins and minerals, micronutrients, regenerative farming can help with that too, and the omega-3 content of meat and dairy, all things that uh, can help our bodies manage some of the processes of inflammation that are at the root of the chronic diseases that are really plaguing people in the in around the world today, and increasingly so on the westernized those of us on a westernized diet. So we all know that the things that 
we eat matter to our health. You know, we know that like a nice fresh apple is better than a bag of potato chips. And there's no doubt that what we eat matters to our health. But what we found interesting in researching what your food ate is it also looks like the health of the land translates into the health of people through, via what we eat. And that the way that our food ate ends up mattering to what we get out of our diet, which leads us to the conclusion that what's good for the land is good for us too. The act, what we would do to restore carbon to our soils, to restore health and fertility to our soils, will also pay benefits in terms of human health at a population level, um, in particularly in terms of helping manage chronic diseases. Now, it's really hard to connect those dots from you know individual farm or farming practice to, to our health as individuals, but we tried in the book to break it into the connection, you know, baby steps along the way and you can connect all the baby steps which suggests that there are linkages that would play through but we're sort of at the early days of figuring it all that out in terms of the details and mechanics but i think we know enough about how to recommend a style of regenerative farming that would really help so um that's what i really wanted to say on this the only other things i'll note is that if you want to uh, um, uh, connect with ann or i in a non-academic context feel free to get in touch with us through our website or twitter we're not all that active on either, but, uh, and also if you're interested in music, I'm still playing in uh, Big Dirt. We just put our uh, fifth album out a couple of years ago. We've got a sixth that'll be released in about a month or two. Uh, and you can listen to us on Spotify or iTunes or whatever, if you want it, should you uh, happen to like brand new classic rock. Uh, any case, uh, that's what I wanted to get through. Uh, and I'm happy to engage in questions. Uh, and I think I can stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, fascinating talk, Dave. I see that we already have a few questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I'll just mention if uh, if somebody missed it before, um, you can ask your questions in the chat and we will read them out loud, or you can uh, raise your hand using the emotion button you have at the bottom of your screen, and then we will uh, we'll allow you to un unmute yourself and you can ask your question uh, directly to Dave. Uh, and so I'll start and... Um, the first question is a technical one is, <laughs> will this webinar be available for viewing later? So yes, uh, this talk has been recorded and the same with all of our uh, talks, it will be uploaded both to our YouTube channel and to our website and you can check it out there. Um, and I'll read the next um, actual question from Tristan uh, writes, who writes, I work with no-till method often used, uh, I'm sorry, this looks to be cut off, Says, isn't it like that farmers who use no-till methods use even more chemistry on their fields? Yeah, that's a really great question and a great point. And I, I deal with that extensively in Growing a Revolution, uh, but I'll try and deal with it sort of uh, uh, briefly here. Um, yeah, one of the things that actually facilitated the spread of no-till farming is that, it, is that glyphosate is the easy button for weed control. And, and weeds are a big, far, uh, a big perceived farm, uh, problem for many farmers, a big actual problem for many farmers too. Um, but the, the ability to grow a crop uh, and uh, without the weed pressure uh, was a big attraction of glyphosate resistant uh, crops. And because then if, if you can spray glyphosate on your field and kill everything except your crop, that's weed control. The problem is, of course, is it scrambles the soil microbiome and there's solid evidence that it scrambles the microbiome in chickens, pigs and goats when they consume grains that have had a lot of glyphosate on them. There haven't been studies on the human microbiome that I'm aware of, but those really need to be done. Um, but there's so, yes, if you look at no till farmers around the world, they're some of the biggest users of herbicides, but they don't have to be. And that's the catch. So I spend about three chapters in Growing a Revolution talking about you know, modifications to practices that farmers can make to basically do uh, um, low input or low herbicide no-till. And we've even visited um, organic no-till farms that do not use any uh, herbicides at all uh, and that are very, very successful. So how do they do it? They do uh, alternative means of weed control. And uh, one way to do that is to essentially use cover crops to outcompete weeds. So in other words, you grow weeds, the cover crops, in way, and you terminate them or kill them prior to the next crop. And then you turn those weeds into green manure or, or mulch. But then the key is you have to take them out before they go to seed. Otherwise, they replicate and then they really are weeds. 
Um, so there's agronomic ways to actually try and deal with that. There's another thing called a, a crop roller that helps to, uh, to terminate cover crops. It's basically like a steamroller drum with big metal chevrons to crunch the plants that you can put on the back of your no-till plant, on the front of your no-till planter. Uh, and so you can go across the fields, mow down your cover crops, plant right into them. Those cover crops are a mulch that basically keep the word that has been... Um, has kept other weeds out. And then if your crops come in and grow up faster than the weeds, you can even just leave the weeds there because they'll become uh, manure, green manure for the next um, um, harvest. In other words, there's ways to do that. Um, but yes, no-till farmers are some of the worst offenders around the world in terms of herbicide use today. Um, and that's why I spent so much time on it in, in uh, growing a revolution to try and investigate, do they have to be? Or are there alternatives? And they're, they're very, very, uh, viable alternatives, but it requires them to think differently about their farming methods and in particular about their soil. And it make, and it requires doing things a little different. And it's hard to ask people to do something different. We all have our habits. Thanks, Dave. So we have another question by uh, Alexandria Coster. So you mentioned that farmers who adopt principles of conservation of agriculture don't need to use fertilizers after some time. Have you investigated how this directly affects surface uh, runoff and groundwater in terms of contaminants? Yeah, the short answer is no. Someone should do that. <laughs> that would be a great study to do. Um, and I encourage you to do it. Uh, I have not done it. Um, the, and I don't know of anyone who has done it. Uh, it may have been done. Um, but the, you know, one of the challenges there would be that, um, uh, you know, if you, if you, I don't know of any watersheds where like the whole watershed's gone no-till. Um, and what you'd really like to do would be do it not just at a farm scale, but to scale it up and do some larger experiments. Um, and, uh, you know, and if it's mixed in with the farmers who are doing, still doing chemical intensive no-till, and then you have a few regenerative ones or not. But I mean, I'd love to see it at a plot scale uh, done first to try and see. But, you know, if the, if the ultimate source of nitrates in most surface water and groundwater is the um the soluble nitrogen fertilizer that's added then um you know if you the, mo the most logical way to cut off cut it off is to take it out of the source so it should work but i'm not aware of studies that have shown it okay we have a next question by Anne mcdonald uh, dave have you started teaming up with those investigative incentives for soil sequestration of carbon and b stormwater treatment through green facilities Seems like some great uh, cross investigation on net staging here. Yeah, no, I've I've, um, I've talked with a number of people uh, in the in the soil in the carbon accounting business who are very interested in this, um, and there's um, you know there's lots of questions in terms of how how would you measure the change? You know, how many samples? How often? How across a field? There's like endless arguments ar around that and which form of carbon and so forth. Um, but no, I've, I've had more conversations with sort of people in the business end of things who are inter who uh, read one of the books and are interested in it and want to learn a little bit more about it. But no, I have not started uh, uh, anything formal with anyone on that. But I do think there's a lot of great uh, uh, potential there in terms of thinking about how, how fast you could put how much carbon in the ground. And, and how would you account for it? I mean, that's really the tricky part. Okay, I'll read the next uh, question from uh, Bata, who's asking, what's stopping agriculture practices switching to regenerative practices? What is the difference in labor between the two agri-practices? Yeah, so can we big oh. scale it? Can we make this large scale? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've visited both small scale farms and very large scale ones. And in terms of uh, in terms of labor, it's really different depending on what scale you're at, because, you know, if you're dealing with a 20,000 acre farm, you're not going to be doing anything that's labor intensive. But there's um, there are different methods that can be adapted to those different scales. Uh, some of the small no till vegetable farms I've visited, they're very labor intensive. Uh, you know, you've got sort of a family and six or seven other workers working the place um, um, and they can be actually very profitable on on you know, just a couple acres. Um, the the no-till vegetable farms I was looking at in, in uh, Connecticut and in California were pulling in a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on a few acres, which is enough to support um, um, some folks. Uh, in terms of very large scale uh, 
stuff. Uh, the John Deere company sells no-till planters that uh, they're expensive. They're not cheap, but so, but a large scale, it's a capital intensive operation, but it can be done uh, in terms of no-till in ways that minimize disturbance of the soil, minimize the input use. Um, so there's ways to adapt it. I, I don't think scaling is so much an issue in terms of feasibility, but you have to do it very different. You can do it very differently at different scales and that you can't do the labor intensive at really large scale. So it, I find it productive to think about regenerative farms at sort of three different levels. There's the sort of in-city urban farms that are going to be you know, some small urban homesteaders uh, doing mostly vegetable production because that's a high cash value crop per acre. Whereas when you're looking at uh, grains, it's a low cash value per acre. So you're looking at rural areas and large acreages, and you're probably talking large scale mechanization. So when we talk regenerative farming, it's not necessarily, you know, non-industrial farming. Some of the farms I've been on are pretty huge and highly mechanized. What's common is how they think about and treat their soil in terms of putting building soil health at the, found, at, at the root of the kind of practices that they're looking to, to um, use. Thanks, Dave. So we have another question. Um, how will regenerative cultivation affect the crop maturity time and yield compared to conventional method? Uh, with the maturity time, I don't know. I've not looked at that. Um, I don't, I never heard any of the conventional, uh, the regenerative farmers complain about differences that were adverse to them. W one of the most surprising things to me in looking into this was that the yields on the regenerative farms usually came back to or exceeded their conventional neighbors within about two, three, four, worst case, five years. So a several year depression in yields, because if you take if you take a, a farm that has been uh, farmed with very uh, nitrogen intensive methods, for example, for 100 years, and all of a sudden you cut way back on the nitrogen, um, there's going to be a yield dip because uh, you've got to rebuild the soil organic matter, the soil and nitrogen as an alternative source. Um, but I was surprised how short that period is, an average of about three years or so. So there's sort of a, a real challenge for adopting regenerative practices is how do you get the farmers to A, think differently and try something new, B, uh, even if they're thinking differently, take the risk of doing it on their farm, their livelihood. Um, nobody likes to bet the farm on something they don't think or are not confident will work. Um, and then um, the, uh, oh, I forgot what the third one was, but the, um, there, there's some barriers there in terms of transition time and thinking about it. Um, and also the, some barriers in terms of education and sort of knowing about it. You think of in the US at least, where do farmers get the advice on how they should be treating their land? From their fertilizer dealer. Guess what they get advised to do? Okay, we have a next question by Coley uh, T. Uh, two questions, in fact. What are your thoughts on permaculture? On the second one, what's one thing that non-farmers can do to help soil? Uh, it's a great question about permaculture. I mean, there, there's a number of examples of agricultural styles, permaculture, biodynamic farming, agroforestry, that are pretty much regenerative and have been for a while. Under, and I consider regenerative as sort of a bigger tent umbrella that could cover those. Because if you look at those sort of minimizing disturbance, growing a diversity of things, um, you know, keeping living things growing, you know, permaculture, most biodynamic farms, they, they meet those criteria, if not exceed them. Uh, in terms of prioritizing soil health. So I think there, there's some really good examples of systems that have been pretty successful, um, but that could be considered to be part of a bigger umbrella effort to, to enhance uh, soil health and rebuild soil health. In other words, I think you can, you can rebuild soil health and fertility without needing to be permaculture or, or biodynamic. But if you are biodynamic and permaculture, you're probably already doing it. And so uh, I, I will skip the next question by uh, Michael Kirkby, because I think uh, you pretty much answered it. He asked about um, what, what is stopping farmers? And I think uh, you, in your previous question, uh, you answered it. Well, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it, it's, part yeah. Aware, it's part awareness, it's part risk aversion, and a big part is subsidies. I mean, our, the, our agricultural subsidies are basically underpinning uh, conventional practices in terms of like crop insurance, so that if you if your crop fails, you get the lion's share of your money back. Um, and that's so the, the, the incentive systems that we've set up in our regulatory environments uh, very much favor maintaining conventional practices by uh, subsidizing them or making it difficult and penalizing farmers who do things different. For until very recently in the US, 
if you planted cover crops, you couldn't get crop insurance. So, you know, wh what's a farmer going to do? They're going like, to go, oh, cheap crop insurance or grow a cover crop. And if I get a lot of hail, I go out of business. No, they're, they're going to stick with the conventional model in that case. So I think we've got, a, there's a few barriers in terms of, there's the education and awareness barrier. And the places I've seen the most rapid adoption of conservation farming um, or conservation agriculture, as the UN uh, calls it, or regenerative farming in a broader sense, are places where uh, demonstration farms have been established that um, show at farm scale that these practices actually work and work economically and, and done by real farmers and not academics. Um, and because that farmers will pay more attention if it's done at scale by other farmers. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, helping to advance adoption by setting up demonstration farms in partnership with academics to figure out what's the best way to, to do this style of farming in different regions. And that's the tricky part too, is, and also I think a barrier to adoption, is you can't just take the stuff that someone did on a farm in North Dakota and take it to Africa or England. It's not going to work. You've got to figure out how to actually tailor it to the climate, the geography, the crops people want to grow. Um, even different areas of the, of the same farm. But the commonality is really thinking about building soil health, soil organic matter, and the, the beneficial life in the soil. Um, and when you start getting into bio, you know, wild biology like that, um, it's, um, it's not always straightforward. So there's a bunch of challenges. But I, I think, you know, top of my list in terms of biggest barriers are the incentive system that's, that we've set up in the regulatory and subsidy environment through our agricultural policies and practices. Yeah, so we have another question by Emily. So if I am a senior geology major in undergrad, uh, what types of things can I do in my future career to help with regener regenerative agriculture? Ah, um, well, I think one of the things that um, is, I think, really surprisingly missing from a lot of the literature are studies of what suites of practices do in terms of reducing soil erosion and increasing soil organic matter. Um, there's a lot of studies that have looked at individual practices. Does no-till increase soil organic matter, for example? And what you find in that one is that, well, it depends on all the other things that you're doing. Um, and when I parsed that literature, what I basically found is that the few studies that have looked at, well, what about this whole system of uh, no-till cover crops and diversity uh, due to soil organic matter? It goes up. Erosion goes down. Organic matter goes up with the full, the full suite. Um, so, in other words, there's still a lot of room for some basic studies to actually be done to look at some of these connections, and particularly at, uh, uh, collaborating with agronomists who may be more interested in, in yield, uh, and people in the medical profession who may be more interested in how much beta carotene is in that carrot, or how much lycopene is in that tomato. Um, so, I think, and I think that the, the, the nutrition world really would benefit from more input from people who understand um, uh, how farms work, uh, ranging from how the soil how the soil works, how the soil how soil is made, how soil fertility is enhanced, how soil is lost, um, and what that means for what's getting into plants. Um, but you know, from the strictly geology end of things, you know, it's mostly sort of looking at erosion and organic matter uh, and the connection to say groundwater. That th that whole question that came up earlier of of nitrates of how much could we reduce nitrate pollution offsite by simply ch and simply changing the style of farming. Um, there's a lot of room for looking at how um, you know how things scale up to watershed scales, and that's right in the right in the realm of geography and geology. Okay, there's a, there's a last question by uh, Peter Klaus. Do you think that non-soil methods uh, like vertical or indoor farming will play a larger role in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. I often get asked about, you know, what I think about hydroponic farming, soilless farming. Um, and in the U.S., we've now allowed soilless farming, hydroponic farming for it to be organically certified, uh, which really shocked some of the original proponents of organic agriculture in that program. Um, and I think that there's a role for vertical farming and urban farming. I'd like to see it, uh, the role be one more one of soil based uh, urban farming, because I think we'll end up with more nutrient dense crops that way. But even with hydroponic farming, I mean, you can make them nutrient dense by adding soluble minerals to the water feed that it gets. But then you get into questions of sustainability and energetics of, well, where did you get that zinc? How did it get to the, ver to the vertical farm? 
Whereas if you're relying on vermicompost to take that, you know, a third of the food that we import into cities never gets eaten by a person. It ought to then get composted, turned back into vermicompost um, and used as a soil amendment to help with urban farming. There's a huge potential for vegetable production in urban environments, and there's no reason why some of it couldn't be indoor and vertical. Um, but I think we'd get a better product if we look at stuff that is soil based uh, than hydroponic. Um, but then again, there have not been very many studies that have actually looked at the nutrient density of hydroponic uh, foods. There's a lot of companies that'll sell like, you know, lettuce towers for growing lettuce in, in a small apartment, for example. Um, but what, what's in that lettuce, I haven't seen a lot in terms of uh, nutrient studies that have dealt with anything other than just the major element chemistry, which is kind of set by the genetics of the plant. Um, it's, I think the micronutrients and the phytochemicals are where the real health connection actually is. And there's a very, very thin literature on that. Um, so I think there's a potential for urban farming to really help provide fresh produce to urban, the urban populace. Um, but how we do it in cities is probably something we should still be debating and investigating. Um, okay, so we seem to have um, one more, a few more questions. Uh, did you observe antagonism when increasing micronutrient availability in the course of uh, regeneration? Oh, you know, um, in, in terms of some things going down where other things going up, we didn't actually uh, have pro a big enough sample size or enough to look at that and actually document whether th those were there. I think that's a really good and important question to look into. Um, and as well as whether that may vary on, in terms of minerals. I mean, the biggest variability we saw was in minerals. Um, in terms of vitamins and phytochemicals, it was much more consistent. Um, but we had pretty small sample sizes on a few farms. Uh, I would be very interested in knowing uh, the answer to the question that you're getting at, and, and I don't know that. Okay, another question. So do you think payments for ecosystem services might help policymakers and farmers adopt restorative agriculture? I do. Um, I had a, a number of conversations with farmers in the American Midwest that suggested that, you know, if they were paid 50 or 60 bucks an acre for practices that built soil organic matter, it would make a difference to their bottom line. Um, you know, they have some pretty big farms. <laughs> um, the And, and pay, pretty much the more they got paid for that, the more likely more of their neighbors would, would be participating as well. Now, I learned pretty quickly in giving, trying, giving talks to farming conferences across the U.S., that when I talked about soil restoration and rebuilding soil organic matter, I learned not to lead with the climate connection because that wasn't necessarily what motivated most of the people I was talking to. Um, what, so what I led with was reduced fertilizer costs, reduced diesel costs, um, because farmers are pretty squeezed between high, high prices for the things they need to farm conventionally and the low prices they get for their harvest because they're so good at growing so few things. The next question, uh, a basic question, how is the situation on soil regeneration, composition, humus in large scales going in the US? Um, yeah, it's, I could either put my optimist hat on or my pessimist hat on for to answer this one. Uh, so I'll do the optimist hat first. Um, you know, b back when I wrote Dirt, I think it came out in 2007. Um, there was nobody, nobody's talking about soil health or regenerative agriculture and, you know, and I'm not taking credit for starting that. It was a movement that was growing at the time, but it was just embryonic at the time. Um, and so I, now, so when I would be first asked to go to farming conferences, it was always to talk about the ancient history, to talk, you know, here's the dirt guy coming to talk about farming in ancient Greece kind of a thing. Um, and then, you know, more re now there's a huge interest in soil health in the farming community. Uh, it's actually being talked about in, at the COP conference in, in Egypt soon. It's in terms of soil organic matter and the potential to take some out of the atmosphere and put it back into soil. There's a talk in the USDA and in the Farm Bill now about um, uh, you know, changing some of our subsidies and, and programs to encourage adoption of more regenerative agriculture. And there's huge and growing interest in farming communities. But it's still, we're down, I think we're down at just a few percent of American farmers are farming in what I would call a regenerative fashion, using all three principles. But about a third of American cropland is already in no-till. And, and I think I've seen some estimates suggesting that's getting up to near half. Um, so I think there's been a lot of progress, 
And, you know, and as a geologist, I can kind of look at it and go, oh, you know, going from zero to 50 in, two, in a decade or two, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, but we really need to change a lot of this over the next couple decades. So it needs to accelerate. Um, and that's where I'm, I'm concerned with, with uh, policies and subsidies and encouragements to adopt more generalized adoption of regenerative practices. Because frankly, I haven't seen the downside of them yet when they're done right. If they're done wrong, I mean, you, you can screw it up in terms of starting. Um, like if you go, if you have a field that's always been on corn and soybeans and you decide to go regenerative and you're just gonna go cold turkey and you're gonna cut the nitrogen off, but the first crop you're gonna grow in your diverse rotation is corn, you're gonna have a failed crop um, because corn's a very nitrogen hungry crop. And if you don't have much stored in the soil and you don't add any, you're just not gonna get much yield. So th there's, there's, um, uh, now I've forgotten what the original question was, so I better stop. <laughs> okay, I think um, we are all out of questions. Um, we have some questions whether or not you you would be willing to share your presentation slide. Uh, I will leave it up to you if you or people can, I guess, also email you. Uh, if they want the presentation uh, yeah, slide. Yeah, if you're interested, if you're interested in that, email me directly, and I'll discuss that with my wife, who 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 helped me put it all together. Um, thank you so much again for your talk. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, it was definitely um, a bit of a change of pace for us in this uh, heavily geomorphological seminar. And so I, I enjoyed it greatly. Well, thank and, you. It's, um, been, it's been a big change of pace for me too, looking at this stuff and thinking about it, but it's been a lot of fun. All right, uh, everybody, you are welcome to join us ne next week when uh, Nathan Brown will be talking about OSL. So back to classic geomorphology. Uh, okay. Enjoy the, the rest of your day or evening and goodbye everyone.